Alex Katie. Um, I'm a fly fishing guide down here in Southern California. Fish me in the Diamond Valley, Castaic Lake, other places of that nature. And I also do summertime guiding up in Mammoth as well. Um, and what I'm doing is a presentation on bass fishing and striper fishing, mainly in Diamond Valley Reservoir, where it can be used in any of these Southern California water pounds with very good success. What I'm hoping to gain is to break this myth that everybody thinks that bass fishing is a giant fly, giant lures that you have to use, that these fish are some kind of creature that aren't the smartest thing they'll eat what's ever in front of their face. You have to think of these fish like they are a trout. They eat on certain times. They feed on certain hatches the time of year. They sit in certain spots that they like to sit in. Just not wherever they can be, not in the deepest, darkest trees, like points, cover. And hopefully, by getting this information to you guys, you guys can go out and start having success, and more success, going out and fishing with these guys, and bring more people in this bass fishing world that is so underutilized. How short it is. It's only about 7 foot 11, I believe. Not 100% on it. But I usually weight that with a seven weight outbound short for my floating lines. For sinking lines, the uh, reel outbound with the sink tip on it, with the type sink six line, that's really good for getting down to like about 20 feet. And then they have the reel intermediate line, really good for that intermediate stuff that you want to go for. And then the 24, sink, 24 foot sink tip that reel has, SA also has one that works really good. But most of the time I find myself using that uh, a type 6 sink tip, go ahead. You were born a little too fast. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's right in the notes. Yeah, okay. yeah it's a little fast. Uh, sorry, a little in there, so I'll try to slow down a little bit here. You did a good job. Um, I had just a 250 grain, just because some people like to use that. 90% of the time, I stick with this one. <coughs> I don't really switch them up too much, because I just, that's the line I feel comfortable with most of the time. And then the other one is I move up to an eight weight. And that's for getting down a little bit deeper. That uh, real outbound, they make a custom head. It's the, T, it's the T11 custom head. And I usually cut it to eh, about 30 feet with the T11 for an eight weight. It seems to be a really good combination. And that sinks at about seven and a half, eight inches a second. And that real outbound line likes to go places in a hurry. And it also very hooks into your skin very nicely if you don't watch out. And then the other one is I'll bump up to a nine weight. And that's for throwing the heavier lines, even up, bumping up into my trout series stuff, into the larger trout patterns and the seven and eight inch and ten inch flies. I know not everybody wants to think about throwing a ten inch fly because their shoulder will be like, I'm abandoning you already later. Yeah. And I usually throw either a T11 on that with a full 35 foot head that it comes with, or I'll use the T14 on it, which is, I'll cut down to about 28 feet, maybe I'll leave it at 30 if you really want to overload the rod. And then my leaders I like to use. I make my own handmade leaders most of the time, so what I like to use it is about 3 feet of 40 pound, 40 pound test, and then I bump that down to two feet of 30. These really aren't general strict guidelines, but they're kind of, this is what works fairly well. If you want to use heavier up, if you say you want to use just straight 20 pound, I would jump that 40 pound up to 50 pound, and then you can go from there. So I'll go down to a foot and a half of 20, and then I'll have another foot and a half of 15. And you can tie that straight off and use that for flies. But normally I th jump down into the 8 to 12 pound flies. Especially cast egg in our places you can get away with using like 6 pound test. <coughs> I don't really do that Diamond Valley. You're going to hook, and if you hook a fish over 5 pounds at Diamond Valley, you're not going to land them on 6 pound test in the trees. No chance. He's going to take you right in and you're going to be on the boat having a hissy fit, crying and everything else. Okay, the flies that I use. Probably the two biggest flies that I really like, go ahead and click again, is these two. Diamond Hair Streamer up here, and this little Enrico's EP Minnow. I was tying them back there a little bit. You guys can watch me tie them up. Um, I keep a lot of different sizes. We 
because not just like going out trout fishing, not just one giant size is going to work over everything else. What you want is I like to have one inch, two inch, three and four inches, all different sizes. Because you'll come across in the fall, early in the fall, when the shad just get done spawning, their eggs hatch, you're going to have bait fish that are maybe an inch long out there. And you will see guys out there, bass fish, being just going, there's fish everywhere, but I can't get them to eat. That's because they can't use anything under two inches. And they won't touch it if it's bigger than that. So having these different sizes is really, really key. My biggest bass that came off a fly that was barely an inch long. I don't know the official weight, but I know it's probably right around 12 pounds, maybe a little bit more. And then I forgot, like the Clouser Minnow, that's another really good pattern. I don't use a ton of the heavy weighted patterns, so I like patterns that sit a little bit more evenly, so when you strip them, they stop and pause. I don't always like the up and down, but they do have their time and place. I do carry them when I go out fishing, just in case. Now, it's not all shad and minnows. When you start getting into the summertime, you need to start bumping up to stuff. You can use the blue go pattern, especially spring and middle of summer. Ooh, there's no better way to get nice size largemouth than this on a bluegill pattern. And I tie them from two inches all the way up into the four, five inch, maybe even six inch ring when there's some really big bluegill around. And the rice is for some good entertainment, some really big fish. Especially in the springtime when bass are getting ready to spawn. Oh, 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 they already have a really good <laughs> hatred for those things. <laughs> you start getting more in the summertime, you get baby bats when they hatch off. When they hatch off, you usually <coughs> depends on time of year, anywhere from April all the way through into July. You'll get them an inch, and then they keep growing bigger, all the way up into six, seven inch long patterns for people that want to throw bigger stuff and have a fair chance of bigger fish. And then the wintertime, I can't go without saying trout patterns. If you can toss them, go for it. If you have the heart for it, because it can be a whole day and only all you get is follow. But you could get one grab. It could be a world record fish. That's the thing about the trout. You never know when you get hit with a giant trout pattern what it's going to be. But I always toss that in my big, my nine weight, maybe even a ten weight if I have to. And then one more click. Top water stuff that I like to use. We don't always use a ton of stuff. Um, the cool dancer is so awesome. It's just like a Zara's boot has this really nice action to it. Probably number one that I use. Poppers, uh, foam sliders, and the same kind of shapes and sizes that I have in the minnows up here. But I don't always get a chance to use those. A little bit here in the mornings and the evenings, but most of the time when I find the fish feeding heavily, especially on shad, I catch them down below. That's where you're going to get your bigger fish, that's where you can get more fish, unfortunately. Same thing like trout fishing. Not all your big fish come off the dry flies. Okay? Now, there's a few little techniques that you need to go through before you go fishing. And the first one is casting. Practice casting. Just don't go out there and be like, I can cook fish. You need to learn how to cast these shooting heads and cast them efficiently. It's a big key from being able to cast 40 feet to 50 feet. It'll almost double. If you can cast further than that and have control, even better. You don't need to cast 110, 115, 120 feet with these lines. If you can cast 80 feet with them, with control, you will be doing better than most of the people out there. Because it's not always your launch and these flies. You need to have a good cast and control in between trees, around edges, and stuff like that. Because there's just so much trees down there, okay? Now, what I mean by get to know your line. Practice with the line that you know beforehand. Get to know it, especially your sink line. Know the sink rates on it. I mean, the lines that I use, I know they sink at 6 inches a second. I know they sink at 8 inches a second. I know they sink at 9. And I know that so I can make a countdown as I'm fishing. So as I'm making my cast, I can be at 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. So I can, like an 8 inches a second line, every 3 seconds it's going to sink 2 feet. So it makes math a lot easier, especially on those 30, 40, 50 foot sinks that you need to use sometimes in the winter time or when you're chasing striper when they're down deep. <coughs> and then also know the feel of your line too. When you go out, know what it feels like to strip that line. Also let it hit the bottom. Know what it feels like when you're dragging on something. Because you'll do that a lot when you cast and your line will be riding over a tree and you'll be like, oh it just feels a little weird. That would be a good indication to either 
You ready? So when you hit the tree, you can strip it off instead of setting a hook on the thing and losing another fly. So big key is know your line. Even when you're on the boat, too, you'll be drifting, and you won't know the feel of your line, so you might just be picking up slack on it, and your line's just sitting there sinking, not actually retrieving it in. So you can even go to local parks, local ponds, go to the ocean, go wherever you can. Get to know what your line feels like when you're stripping it in, when you're caught on something, when you're not caught on something, everything of that line. That one. And then next one is, get a map, please, for the lakes that you fish. Diamond Valley, Cascade, read these maps, look at them, use some of the information I'm going to give you guys. Use forms. Everybody posts it on forms nowadays. You can even go to regular fishermen forms and they'll say, oh, we're hooking fish off the end of points in this deep of water. And you can use that same information to when you go out the next day. So you can take a look and just go, marker, oh, that looks similar, that looks similar, that looks similar. And you have a general direction instead of just going out there and just just throwing darts randomly with your eyes closed. Okay? Now, since we're that time of year, winter time. That's the cold water time. Usually, it doesn't last too long. <coughs> it's only December through January. Maybe if we're unlucky, it goes through February. That's when those water temps start dropping below that 60 degree mark. Those fish start going down deep. They leave their nice ponds up in that 5 to 25 foot zone, and they go down 25 feet and deep. Yeah. It's not uncommon for fish at Diamond Valley or bass to go down 150 feet. Even largemouth will do the same thing, just like stripers. And when they do that, unfortunately, it gets tough to tough to hook them that way. So you can't always. Most of the time, you can find them in that 25 to 50 foot realm year round. There during the winter. So go ahead and click on that one. So the stripers, their main food is shad and trout. more than me. Mainly, the stripers are all driven by where the shad are. And the shad, that time of year, they don't like any water temps below that 60 degree mark. So they're going to go down deep on nice even temperatures and follow the thermocline down there. Because the shad really hate major fluctuations in temperature. If you get giant drops of like 3, 4, 5 degrees during the day, it can actually kill shad. They would much rather be in uniform water than in nice warm water. And then, of course, trout. They love trout, they'll stick near the marina. If you can get them on the stocking day when they're feeding on trout, you can hook some of the biggest stripers of your life. And the stripers normally, where they'll be hanging, they usually go deep during winter. But they will come up in certain places. Places where you get current at. So say you get current off of main points, by the dam where the pump pit house is at. Any place where you get sharp uh, structure that creates a little bit of current. Every lake has current in it. Even if it's only a mile an hour, it can dictate where these fish are at. And that's what the points do. That's why fish always stick on points. Everybody like, why do you want to fish the point? Why that? Because the points create current, which bait fish have to hide around, and then it creates ambush points for these fish. So that's the big reason why we use points a lot. 